Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Susan Want. I'm the Usher of the Black Rod in the Legislative Council. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today on the land of the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to thank Elders past and present for their custodianship of this land. I'd like to hand over to Uncle Alan for the welcome to country. Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. For my first song, <laughs> nah, I only kidding you fellas. Uh, two apologies for the terrible weather we're having outside at the moment, sorry. And I've been able to welcome you to my country and my language, as we well forbidden to talk our language a long time ago. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters. From whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here today, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things shorter than that, coming, taxation and going. It's an, always an honour and pleasure to welcome one all to Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north, Nepean to the west, and George's River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans. And the clans land we're on today is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal Mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. There's an old saying out there, and I think it's very appropriate for you, Mob, here today. You fellows heard it a thousand times before. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. So once again, on behalf of the Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'd now like to hand over to um, the Minister uh, to say a few words. The Honourable Sarah Mitchell, MLC, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Um, thank you. Thanks, Susan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, too, would um, like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to our elders past, present and emerging. And thank you, Uncle Alan, for your wonderful words, as always. It's always nice to have you uh, here at Parliament and, and to do the, the welcome for us. Um, it's a real pleasure for me, as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, to be able to be here and be part of today. Um, as some of you would have noticed when you came in the House, or both Houses, in fact, are sitting today. So we're sort of in and out and uh, on knowledge my uh, colleague Paul Green from the Upper House who is here. I think we're the only ones who are sort of wagging to be here, don't tell anybody. Um, and I, I think the Lower House is sitting, but I'm sure other members will come and go throughout the presentation. Um, I'd also like to, to thank and welcome our speakers, and I don't want to steal anybody's thunder in terms of the MC and, and the, the presentations that we uh, will hear today, but certainly... Um, to, to welcome Philippa Scarlett, uh, Professor John Maynard, Michael Bell uh, and also Uncle Harry Alley. I had a chance to have a brief chat to Uncle Harry earlier and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing from him as well. Um, this is a great event that I think we're having here at Parliament and I do just want to acknowledge Susan and everyone at the Parliament who has worked really hard uh, to put this together. Um, I think that it's important that we um, you know, talk about these sort of issues and raise awareness of uh, the important role that Aboriginal men and women have played in our armed forces over the years. And um, I, I was doing a little bit of research and a bit of uh, quite interested to hear um, what information was available. And it's interesting to know that prior to about the 1970s, there wasn't really a lot known about um, 
um, the armed forces and the role of Aboriginal men and women in, in those roles. Uh, and subsequent research has established a record of Indigenous service dating back to the start of the Commonwealth era in 1901. And I'm told um, even a small number of individual enlistments in the colonial defence forces before that, which is quite extraordinary uh, when you think about it, because initially federal legislation uh, actively prohibited Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people enlisting in the Australian Imperial Force. And as I'm sure we'll hear about today, um, I'm told that many men volunteered, were rejected, uh, and many in fact uh, changed their identity so that they wouldn't be recognised as Aboriginal people so that they could serve. Uh, and again, I think that's just a, a remarkable set of circumstances that led people uh, to, to serve our country. The men who did serve, served with distinction uh, and were treated the same as, the, as their fellow soldiers. And for many of them, they received equal treatment for the first time in their lives while they were serving, only to come back home um, and continue that state-sanctioned discrimination and prejudice. So quite a remarkable time to be thinking and talking about that at the moment and what those men uh, would have gone through. It's estimated that over a 1,000 uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people volunteered in the First World War, uh, over 500 from here in New South Wales, and more than 250 were killed. And I think it's critical uh, that these men are acknowledged, that they are recognised and respected, and that they are honoured. And I think events like what we are doing today um, is really important to raise awareness uh, of this part of our history, which is really important. So thank you for letting me, me be here and be a brief part of it. As I said, I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, the fabulous speakers that we we have today and I hope all of you uh, enjoy this afternoon and your time here with us at Parliament House. Thanks. I'll hand over to Sarah, I think. We'll do that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Minister. Just before I hand over to Gary, who is our MC for the, the day, I just wanted to go back a little bit and just explain um, how this forum came, um, came about. Um, it is very important to the uh, small team in the Office of the Black Rod that prepared the part of the exhibition that's now on display in the Fountain Court, in the Parliament's Fountain Court, which is about Aboriginal service in the First World War. Um, when we started, we were largely ignorant of this story and we contacted a lot of people to assist us with getting it together. And a lot of those people are here today. Uh, Gary Oakley, Uncle Harry, um, Michael Bell, Amy Lay, who's uh, in the audience. Uh, Uncle Roy and Uncle David, the State Library, um, the City of Sydney, and of course our own library who are very helpful um, in getting together some information uh, for the exhibition. And the more we read about this story and talked to people, uh, the more profoundly we felt we needed to do this story justice. Um, it's a relatively unknown um, part of our history. Um, the terrible prejudice and discrimination, but of course also the uh, incredible bravery and sorrow um, from the First World War. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody very much for coming, um, thank the speakers again, and I'll hand over to Gary. Um, should I tell them about you or will you do thank it yourself? You. you can do that. Yeah, Gary yeah. Oakley. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Uncle Alan, for your welcome to country. My name's Gary Oakley. My people are the Gundungurra. Um, I'm a New South Wales, Wales boy. I was born in the Blue Mountains, Katoomba, New South Wales. Um, I started my career in the Royal Australian Navy as a 15-year-old junior recruit and spent 22 years as a full-timer in the Navy and another 22 years as a reservist. I spent some time as a reserve when I was a reservist as a curator at the Australian War Memorial and I'm now a squadron leader in the Royal Australian Air Force. Um, and my, I work for Indigenous Affairs in the Air Force. And my job is I'm the Air Force's Indigenous Historical Custodian. So my job's all things history. Um, so that's me. Um, some housekeeping. If you need the bathrooms, the toilets, straight out the door and in the little passageway in front of you, or you go through the mirror, uh, mirror doors and you turn to the left and they'll be on that side as well. If there is an event that happens here and you're asked to leave a fire or some other thing, please leave um, cautiously and don't rush when you go out and take note what you're told by the security people, please. Um, our first, oh, um, I'd also like to say to our um, speakers, 
you've only got 10 minutes each or roughly 10 to 15 minutes each so if you could keep it to your 15 minutes it would be fine um, we're going to try um, to get through this enough in enough time so that we can actually have a question session afterwards so our first speaker is Philippa Scarlett um, she's a historian and the author of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Veterans uh, for the AIF. You'll actually, at, on the desk out the front, there's a copy of her book. Um, she's going to give you an update on her research and give the context to the history and story of Aboriginal service in the First World War. Uh, I'd like to present Philip Scarlett. Okay, well, um, good, after every, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about Aboriginal War service in World War One, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal clan of the Eora and its elders and th to thank them for their custodianship of, the, of this land. Now today I want to talk generally about Aboriginal World War One service and to put it in context and also comment on where we are now a hundred years from the armistice, after the armistice. It's well known that the 1909 amendment to the Commonwealth Defence Act of 1901 stated that men not substantially European were barred from serving their country. And the, back, the background to this was the racism which infected Australia before and after Federation. In fact, the rhetoric of recruiters and politicians was that the AIF was fighting to keep Australia white. Despite this, my latest figures, amended as recently as just a few days ago, <coughs> show that 1,223 um, um, enlistments are verified or attempts to enlist and that 833 of these men actually served their country overseas. And I should say that honour is due too to the willing but unsuccessful, in fact to all who volunteered in the face of legislative and social discrimination. The contribution of those who were successful was comprehensive. Their records show that they served in artillery brigades, machine gun companies, infantry, pioneer, motor transport and cyclist battalions, light horse, remounts, camel corps, tunnelling, veterinary and railway units, supply and transport units, medical corps and hospital units. In fact, in all light horse regiments and in all but one of the 61 infantry battalions. They volunteered throughout the war from 1914 on and served at Gallipoli, and in every major theatre of war. They were decorated for gallantry, four distinguished conduct medals, three from New South Wales, military medals and were mentioned in dispatches and even awarded the Belgium Croix de Guerre, as well as losing their lives or suffering ongoing mental and physical trauma on their return. Yet, their service was ignored and then forgotten by their country, but not, I should add, in most cases by their families. The predecessor of the RSL in the 1930s did seek out and publish the names of 245 indiv individuals in the journal Revalley, but this was for a limited military and veteran audience, and so was the revival of this list in the 1970s, after its accidental discovery by a military historian. And the few publications which followed were mainly by, by um, were mainly by military historians or published in military history journals. At the same time, books by Aboriginal people or those connected to them, like Naranjeri Anzacs and Forgotten Heroes by Doreen Katinari and Alec Jacomos, respectively, were being published. But these were primarily reaching an Aboriginal audience. And so was the groundbreaking 2002 National Archives Bringing Them Home Indigenous Soldier List, which brought recognised numbers from 245 to over 600. Well, to cut what's a long story short, sometime between the 1970s and the early 2000s, against the backdrop of increasing Aboriginal-driven prominence for Aboriginal issues, from the tent embassy to stolen, to stolen children and the general intensification of Australia's war remembrance, Aboriginal war service in World War I began to emerge from the province of military history and Aboriginal family history. And as the, as the century progressed, achieved a place as a recognised part of Australia's war history, signposted by its inclusion in the Oxford Centenary History of Australia and the Great War, published in 2015. And in 2017, Bennett and Harry Otte's book, Australians in the First World War. 
And this mood of recognition has been bolstered by very public events like Ray Minikin's Coloured Diggy March, first held in 2007, and Tom Wright and Wesley Enoch's 2015 play Black Diggers and the War Memorial's touring exhibition for Country for Nation, um, ser no, ser Serving Our Country, perhaps, or both titles, I think. Perhaps most symbolic to date was the War Memorial's invitation in 2017 to Aboriginal veterans and their descendants to lead the Anzac March. So the fact of Aboriginal war service has emerged from the shadows, but what do we actually know about it? The National Archives' digitisation of the records of the first AIF has provided an invaluable opportunity to find out and has been the means of coming up with some surprising results. A key aspect of knowing the numbers and names of volunteers is that this enables us to begin to tell in more detail the story of Aboriginal service. And the overall story is now taking a slightly different shape from what it was previously thought to be. My overview of the records undertaken in early 2015 and reinforced by examination of the over 200 men whose service has since been uncovered shows some interesting things. Race was not required to be stated on the enlistment form, but it sometimes was. And when this happened, there could be one of two results. A man was refused enlistment, or although named as Aboriginal, he was successful. So it's clear that the Defence Act provisions were inconsistently applied. Reinforcing this is that external descriptive sources can show a man was undoubtedly Aboriginal, but this was not stated by recruiters on his successful enlistment. Further, my examination showed that a military order in May 1917, as general enlistment was faltering, allowing men with one white parent to enlist, in practice legitimising what was already happening, had no effect on overall Aboriginal enlistments, despite was and sometimes still is assumed. Aboriginal enlistments as a whole remained in decline, and in fact I found that the majority of men enlisted in 1915 and 1916. The records show too that these men came overwhelmingly from country areas and with few exceptions were labourers or engaged in bushwork or labouring occupations. At the same time, records also show unexpectedly that a, that a small and I think significant proportion came from cities and suburban places like the 50 odd men born in the Sydney region. What the records also show is that only 12% demonstrated any connection with missions. And this contradicts common perceptions about Aboriginal people. There's a reason for this in New South Wales at least, and one which is connected with the question why they volunteered. I've speculated that volunteering was related to, ex to aggressive recruiting campaigns and the usual reasons like pay and adventure, but there's no written evidence for this. A Queensland Aboriginal man in 1935, wrote that he thought fighting would give him rights in his own land. But while there's no reason to disbelieve him, to date there is nothing to be found stating this during the war itself. However, what we do know is that the records and contemporary newspaper articles show clearly that, like non-Aboriginal men and their families and communities, Aboriginal desire to, su to support king and country and empire was an often repeated sentiment. The son of an Aboriginal World War I soldier told me recently that his father had served because he did not want his country to be invaded yet again. And country for Aboriginal people had and has a deeper and different meaning than for the descendants of white invaders and later immigrants. As for King, it's also possible to speculate that Aboriginal people saw the King as somehow apart from Commonwealth discriminatory acts and repressive state protection regimes, which dominated Aboriginal lives. In New South Wales, state protection was becoming more oppressive. And New South Wales was particularly relevant, as according to the records, it was the source of almost half known Aboriginal volunteers. Before the war, a period of increasingly increasing disadvantage for Aboriginal people was setting in. The 1909 New South Wales Aborigines Protection Act was pushing successful Aboriginal farmers off their land, as well as evicting large numbers of Aboriginal people from missions and reserves. 
many to go to the outskirts of country towns or further out, making enlistment an attractive alternative and is one reason for the low number of mission-connected volunteers. One areas, area the records do not help with is employment. Since the recruiting form did not ask whether a man was in employment at the time of enlisting, just asked for his trade or calling, we've no way of knowing whether a desire for, for a job was relevant to seeking enlistment. I think in New South Wales, given the impact of the 1909 Protection Act, it, it certainly can't be ruled out. The records, which just keep on giving, do show that despite what is often said, some Aboriginal men were members of what is now the RSL and that some received repatriation benefits. But I hasten to say that we know from the bitter memories of families that most had different experiences. The fact was that post-war benefits were not officially denied and received by some, but many found the unofficial obstacles underpinned by race were just insurmountable and so did not even bother to apply. Yet another use of the body of identified names has been to expand the number of known soldier settlers. Consultation with records of settlement schemes in New South Wales shows that there were more than the one or small handful of men usually said, even today, to be the only Aboriginal recipients of settler blocks. The source for the most popular claim is most likely a 1980s study of the Nyampa family of George Kennedy, who received a block at Yelty, New South Wales. In the absence of any other information, he became the only man in New South Wales and sometimes Australia said to receive a soldier settlement block. However, it's now possible to say that the applications of as many as 20 New South Wales men were initially successful. So the examples I've just given show how the identification of Aboriginal volunteers and mining the inf information in their service records is enriching our understanding of Aboriginal war service and challenging some commonly held ideas. Although, of course, in no way changing the central narrative of discrimination and of exclusion from the Anzac legend. Now that things are becoming clearer, the task is to tell the stories of these soldiers. So men like the amazing and tragic prisoner of war Douglas Grant, who lived most of his life in Sydney, are not the only people to be known. Just some of the many New South Wales men are the co-brothers from Cowra, the extended Locke and Lean families from Sydney, the Knights from Louth near Dubbo, the Gamilaroi Darragh Stafford Blackman Budsworth family. And there are countless, even less well-known men whose varied histories are waiting to be unfolded. So where does this actually leave us in 2018? We have come a long way. Recognition is out there. Stories on Indigenous war service frequently appear in newspapers, TV, radio and internet. There are Indigenous war memorials in Adelaide and Sydney and one in the pipeline for Queensland. And at the highest level, the Australian government and all its agencies recognises Indigenous war service. Today we understand that the history of Indigenous people in Australia's conflicts, including World War I, is not just military and the subject of military history alone. It is much broader than that. It is firmly rooted in Australia's racist past and in the struggle to overcome this and for Australia to move forward towards the goal of an inclusive society. But I now want to sound a word of caution. The belated inclusion in our history of Aboriginal war service is all to the good, but at the same time, it's important that it does not become integrated and smothered in the bigger picture. Aboriginal war service in many, many ways was the same as that of other Australians. Things like the suffering and injury, the friendships, fear, the trials of separation from family and country. But it was different too, beginning with the racist, racist society the soldiers lived in before and after the war, the barriers to enlist and post-war lack of recognition and exclusion. And perhaps this is something which other speakers may want to comment on. Well, I'll conclude now by saying that if anyone would like to discuss their relative's war service or seek help in finding out about it, I'd be very happy to help them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, 
Philippa's um, work has given us a bit of th us to have a think about things because it's dispelling some of those myths about Indigenous service. And also, um, when um, Philippa mentioned that there are uh, memorials to Indigenous service, I'd also like to announce that there's going to be a national memorial to Indigenous service in the ACT. It's in being worked on at this very moment. So we will get a national memorial. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor John Maynard. Uh, he's the director of the Burai Global Indigenous and Dis Diaspora Research Studies Centre, Chair of Indigenous History, Wallatuka Institute, Academic Division, and, uh, an adjunct professor, National Centre for Indigenous Studies, Australian National Universities. And he'll speak about ser the Serving Our Country project and do a short reading from the recently released book. Uh, thanks, Gary, for that uh, kind introduction. I also, Uncle Al's just gone, but also acknowledge him for his uh, kind welcome to country. And look, to, um, for me, as a Warramai man, I would also respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their ancestral lands within which I am most honoured once more to be a visitor. And I also acknowledge our <laughs> elders, both past and present. It's important to uh, acknowledge as well that sovereignty over our land has never been ceded. I also acknowledge the Minister, distinguished guests and elders uh, in the audience. Um, I also think in, in light of uh, Armistice um, the other day, a few days ago, that we will certainly acknowledge um, the service of Aboriginal service men and women who have fought in every conflict this country has taken part in from the Boer War right through to Afghanistan today. So we have a really proud history. And the Serving Our Country project, which I was a part of for, um, for I think it was four years or five years, I can't remember now, um, with Mick Dodson, and, um, uh, which went through ANU, but we had the Department of Defence, the Australian War Memorial, Veterans Affairs, um, the Commonwealth Archives, Australian National University, the University of Newcastle and Commonwealth Universities. And over that period of time we, we did interviews in every state and territory in this country. There was wonderful support from community um, in conducting interviews. There is one critical component of all this, there is incredible pride um, carried by our Indigenous families and communities in the service that uh, their forebears uh, provided for the, in fighting for this country. So there is a really proud history. So it was a, it was a great project to be a part of and as I said we, we did interv interviews in every state and territory. We held some important forums and of course the wonderful book um, from New South which has been published in recent times. And I'm just going to um, uh, read a small part out of this particular publication um, and I guess it, it touches on what Philippa was talking about as well that there were several in looking at the First World War there's and I'm sure Philippa would agree with this there's so many intriguing aspects when you're exploring in the archives and and you're delving into memories that have been recorded in the past into our service uh, the roles that Aboriginal men played in that conflict. Um, and I haven't got time to go into all of those here, but I'll touch on enlistment, which Philippa has already mentioned, and also uh, those enlistment forms. We do um, showcase, I guess, where these men came from, when they enlisted, and you know what sort of employment they had. But just to begin to set the tone, the First World War gave rise to an enduring narrative about the soldiers of the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF, in the Anzac legend, the Australian digger was celebrated as the quintessential citizen in arms, affable, courageous, poorly disciplined, a larrikin and a great mate. But where did the Aboriginal soldier sit within this foundational national narrative? We now know that around 1,000, and Philip has actually increased that number, um, and I guess uh, the War Memorial with Michael as well, I've touched on that since. So Aboriginal, over 1,000 Aboriginal men enlisted between 1914 and 1918, many more times than those that served in the Boer War only a decade earlier. With the aid of First World War military records, we can ascertain where these Aboriginal men came from, when they enlisted, as I said before, and how they were employed in that service. Some of the interesting aspects of this, um, previously it has been assumed that it was not until the military authorities relaxed the barriers to Aboriginal enlistment in May 1917, allowing, and I use the word, 
half-castes to enlist that significant numbers of Aboriginal men joined the AIF. In fact, the records drawn upon in this study revealed that the greatest numbers of Aboriginal men signed up in the years 1914 to 1916. Of the 989 records of Aboriginal men examined, 641 of them had enlisted before 1917. However, it is important to note that in contrast to other states, there was a spike in Queensland enlistment in 1917. Hence, the relaxation of official barriers to Aboriginal enlistment was likely to have been motivated not by the AIF's need to recruit more men after huge losses in the Battle of the Somme and the failure of the conscription referendum of October 1916, but rather that the military authorities acknowledged that large numbers of Aboriginal men were already fighting overseas. We now know that uh, from the records that 677 enlisted from country areas and 312 from the city. Were these Indigenous fighters, uh, soldiers fighting for their country, for Australia or the British Empire? We cannot know the answer to this question with any certainty, since few of those who served left any record of their motivation for doing so. As previously discussed, the records of Aboriginal men who joined up suggests that they were previously employed in other occupations. This challenges the idea that the prospect of a wage was the major motivation behind their volunteering. I just want to state too, there's a misconception that Aboriginal people were tightly controlled on mission prisons and reserves. That didn't come until the 1930s, the late 20s. There was a lot more freedom, certainly in the late 19th century, in the early decades leading up to World War I. There were a lot of Aboriginal people on what can be best described as independent farms. Aboriginal people had fought for and regained that land. They had fenced it, they had cropped it, they had cleared it, they had built homesteads on it, they had livestock and they were prospering on it. So Aboriginal men did not go simply to war because they lacked other choices. Some probably signed up for the same reasons as non-Indigenous men, and Philip has touched on this, for travel and adventure, because their mates or brothers had signed up, because they believed in the war effort, or because they were subjected to aggressive recruitment campaigns. However, Aboriginal people were also developing a sense of a pan-national Aboriginal identity loosely tied to the rise of a wider Australian national identity at that particular point in time. Now, one of the, the important points that I wanted to touch on, which I've just lost my place <laughs> in this publication, was the amount of men that, yeah, okay, and I said that Aboriginal men on these enlistment papers, most of them put down their occupations as labourers, uh, shearers, stockmen, labourers, farmhands. But the records also revealed an interesting insight. Uh, some of the Aboriginal men had put down, they were truck drivers, fettlers, dairymen, clothing cutters, masons, miners, clerks, jockeys, contractors, glass workers, machinists, lime burners, butchers, musicians, fishermen, blacksmiths, bakers, plumbers, railway clerks, nurserymen, train engine drivers, oyster merchants, pattern makers, railway porters, motor mechanics, merchant sailors, mechanical draftsmen, students, orchardists, warehousemen, process engravers, musicians, even a dental mechanic, a journalist. So this was, the, this was the stuff that was recorded on these enlistment papers. This is a different history that we haven't been privy to in the past. And I guess that's, for me, in all the work that I do, there's so much of our history that is, and I've always likened it to a giant jigsaw puzzle with many of the pieces missing. We've all got to play a part. All of our families and our communities have an incredible proud history with heroines and heroes in our past. We've all got to play a part in putting these missing pieces back into the jigsaw puzzle. Now, my talk has highlighted some of the varied and intriguing aspects of Indigenous experiences during the First World War. The personal stories embedded within the archival record enhance our understanding of Aboriginal soldiers' experiences on the front line and the difficulties they faced in coming home. Within these records, Aboriginal soldiers' letters and records are tinged with humour and sadness. 
These records also reveal some significant patterns. All the men, as I stated, they were employed. Two-thirds of these men came from or enlisted, as I said, in the rural country regions. One of the most surprising findings was that the majority of Aboriginal men volunteered to serve before, as I said, the military restrictions on Indigenous men were relaxed in May 1917. Many Aboriginal diggers then were connected to country, self-supporting and eager to be part of the broader Australian commitment to the war effort. Privileging Indigenous voices embedded in the Great War enriches and deepens our understandings of Australian history and the savage injustice of the Aboriginal experience. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, if you're really interested in, in uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander military history, I advise you to buy the book. It's an exceptional publication. Um, I'd, I'd also like to now to invite the President of the Legislative Assembly, the Honourable John Ajaka, to um, address the audience. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I take this opportunity to firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, to our MC, Gary, uh, to the speakers today, uh, the Honourable Sarah Mitchell, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I also note uh, my colleague, the Honourable Paul Green, uh, Philip Escalette, uh, Professor John uh, Maynard. I'm so pleased that I know I was meant to speak before. I'm so pleased I ran a little bit late to have the opportunity to hear what you had to say. Um, and I truly appreciate uh, that opportunity. Uh, Michael Bell and, of course, Uncle Harry Ailey. Thank you all of you for being here today to attend this fantastic forum where we recognise and remember the Aboriginal servicemen and women who fought for their country in World War I. Just this morning, I had the honour of returning from a visit uh, to France where I had the honour to lay a wreath on behalf of the New South Wales Parliament at the Australian National Memorial at Villers Bretonneux. I was indeed honoured to attend such a moving ceremony and as I lay the reef, I was contemplating the immense sacrifice of the soldiers that served in that terrible war. We should never forget the service and sacrifice, of course, of the Aboriginal people 100 years ago. And we heard the professor outline it so well. I take this opportunity, and I know I speak on behalf of the whole parliament, to thank the dedicated historians who've brought to light the stories of many of these brave men, which has allowed us to remember them including in our Centenary of Anzac exhibition to be launched tonight, and you're all most welcome. So I take this opportunity to thank you all for being here today and an opportunity for us to not only learn, but to honour all of those who fought for our country and the freedom that we enjoy today, lest we forget. I'd like to now introduce our third speaker. Our third speaker is um, Michael Bell, the Indigenous Liaison Officer. Um, he works for the uh, Military History Section at the Australian War Memorial. Um, and he'll talk about the restrictions faced by New South Wales Aborigines and Torres Strait Islands who sought to enlist in the First World War and the inequity of the society that re they returned to. Michael Bell. Do you want to do it there or here, Mike? Here. Thank you, Mr. Uncle Gary, Sir Oakley. Um, Gary's also a fellow at the Australian War Memorial too, just quietly. Um, firstly, I'd like to also pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and also to acknowledge any elders from any nations that are represented here today. I'd look, also I'd like to acknowledge those who have served those that are still serving and the families that have supported them during this time and the communities that also support them. Just a little bit of a warning, I'd like to um, note that my, my presentation depicts images of deceased Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons and language in this presentation is of a historic context and is used to highlight the society and environment of the day. The, the Australian War Memorial and myself would like to apologise for any offence using this language may cause. 
the memorial knows that this language is unacceptable today, but to use, use, use accepted descriptions would distort the historical contents and purpose of this information. Um, every, everybody has stated here, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have fought um, for Australia in peace and wartime since the Boer War forward. And I'll have to skip the Boer War because I've only got 10 minutes and Gary will have to drag me off here. <laughs> um, that's the Boer War. But we had nine Aboriginal identified men serve in the Boer War. If you hear any different about a, a random 50, it's not true. If it is true, bring me the proof. Uh, this is what the, um, the section 61 of the 1903 amended 1909 section 1 Defence Act looks like. I have to skip through that. But what we're looking at here for us down here is section H. Um, I hope that's not too blurry for you, but it's it's ostensibly reads that persons who are substantially of European origin or descent of which the medical authorities appointed under the regulations shall be the sole judges. That meant the medical officers in the camps determined whether you were too black or not. And um, as Philip has already organised, about 75% of our men got through. And most of them got through before the amendment, of its, which is called Military Order Number 200 or the Half-Caste Law. Joseph William Punch is one of those who got through. Joseph William Punch enlisted in 1915. He's not one of our earliest, but he's one of the late, late bloomers in 1915. Joseph died of disease um, after fighting for his country on the front lines for about 18 months. So clearly Aboriginal. Clearly enlisted. He's a unique story, not a unique story for us because there's several of them. He's a survivor of a massacre. And he was the only survivor of his clan, presumably of the Radjuri Nation down at Lake Cowell. He is, he is survived, raised by white people and uh, lost his culture, his language, his connection, but still served. In the same generation that's stolen everything from him, he serves. And in service, he has found equality. We've got a, another a newly identified, thanks to Philippa, uh, Gunnar John and Leslie Clark. He's also died of disease in May 1915. So to die in May, he's over there in April. So he's in Anzac. He's on Gallipoli. Where previously in 1970, it was taught that Aboriginal men didn't fight in the AIF. The Department of Education provided information to state that. But we have subsequently, and might I say the research that I've done is based nearly mostly on the work of the giants before me, Philippa Scarlett, historian, who's got four volumes of Aboriginal soldiers. Her work is instrumental in what I do at the Australian War Memorial, and Gary Oakley and Margaret Beedman, who uh, followed that up. But it's a collaborative effort nationally, and the, work, the, the studies that I've found and the men that I've found, we find with Philippa, and mostly Philippa Scarlett is... I would consider the godmother of in Indigenous research. But the other protections that we've come on, the, the other restrictions that we've come on is the Aborigines Protection Act of 1909. And as Dr Maynard has pointed out, it started to cut in. But that's only New South Wales. It had been in Victoria for about 30 years and they'd picked it up and moved it up and down the, uh, the, the, colony, the colonies as they were merging and as they were managing the native problem or in the words of one academic, to soothe the pillow of a dying race. So this is, the, this is the problem for us. Not only is it restricted in the Act, but it's the restriction in the, in the um, Aboriginal Protections Act, or the Boards of Protection and the different states. Every, every state had one except Tasmania, because we all know Tasmania had no Aboriginal people. <laughs> I wish there was a Tasmanian here to challenge me. Any Palawa people? Ah, there you go. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> Represent my sister. Um, but this defined Aboriginality. And this is one of the earliest pieces of legislation defining Aboriginals. And it's the control of the boards. These legislations led to stolen generations. It led to the, the disharmony, the dispute, the distrust of what is going on today. So when people say, can't they just get over it? No. These are the powers of the board to distribute clothing, blankets and relief to Aborigines at the discretion of the board. 
to provide the custody, maintenance and education of children of Aborigines. Provide for the custody of. The government owned your children. Think about that. Some of us may remember these, these years, but have a look at what was going on in Australia in 1963. New South Wales was a good state to be living in. Look at Queensland. The marry freely, own your own children, control your own children, move freely, own property freely, receive wages. These are the conditions that existed in Australia. And it wasn't until 1986 that in Queensland they repealed the ability to, tr to pay Aboriginal people less. 1986. But this is what we're referring to here. This is an attestation of one of our Aboriginal soldiers. Uh, Richard's um, a Queenslander. He's a Kwandamooka man. But he enlisted as an Aboriginal man as himself and got refused. And he went back and he changed his identity. He became Richard Martin from Dunedin. He's a New Zealander. And he got accepted. He was 22 years, 11 months, and he was a labourer. Another one of those, John. <laughs> but this is what the instructions looked like in the AIF after the half-caste legislation came out. And it says... Uh, where is it? Which one is it? Men not of substantial European origin or descent are not to be enlisted. Doubtful cases should be referred to the medical officer. So Punch got in. But this is the order that changes that, allegedly. This is the half-caste rule, or the military order 200. And it says... Half-caste may be enlisted in the Australian Imperial Forces provided that the examining medical officers are satisfied that one of the parents is of European origin. Note, all previous instructions on this subject are cancelled. So when you're instruct, this is now non-existent. And this has taken over. But this was in 1917. It came in in March and started coming out in April. This is William Wallace Chatfield. That's William in his wedding outfit, in his uniform, First World War, and he's got a return service badge on. And his mate has too, and his other mate there. Wedding photo, William Wallace Chatfield. William again. But this is William Wallace Chatfield's discharge certificate. And it says... The board finds that he is unfit for active service, unsuitable physique, colour. That man is too black for the AIF. Now, somebody's noticed something here, haven't they? What's he doing in a return service badge and a uniform on his wedding day? Because he went back and he attested and got in and enjoys the last six months of the war in Palestine as a driver. But that's what they had to do. Imagine being told you're too black. That's William Wallace Chatfield. But just to just show that it might have been not sick that day, it might have been a bit green or a bit jaundiced, I've got another little, little uh, discharge certificate. This is of George Hillett, and it finds that George Hillett is unfit for active service, unsuitable physique, Aboriginal. Just to take any problems out that you might have been suspected it was, he wasn't feeling well. And these are the conditions on which our men en enlisted and served, but yet they served in great numbers. Philip is at, at about 1,200 with about 830, did you say, Philip are going active service. So it's staying about the same. 
And um, according to Dr Maynard, there was a little spike in Queensland. That spike, the story needs to be told about that and I don't want to uh, disprove John on the stage, but come and ask me afterwards about the empty saddles march. I'll tell you about that and that'll, that'll quieten the statistical blip that was in Queensland. Um, there's some other numbers. Aboriginal, as we said, have we been participated in every war? The Boer War, we've got nine. The Second World, we're expecting about four to four and a half thousand, and that's men in hats and soldiers and service numbers. We're expecting about the same thing in the ancillaries, and that's the citizens of Australia, Aboriginal citizens of Australia, coming to aid the war effort on the farms and in the beaches, providing labour camps, labour corps, road building, amenities building, a facility building, especially after the um, restrictions do get basically removed when the Japanese hit the door. When the Japanese come to your front door, the politicians don't care what colour your skin is. And then we've got the, the BCOF. We've got, we got estimated 50, we've got 35. The Korean War, we're currently estimated 300 with about, with about 80 identified and we're looking at about 700 in, the, in Vietnam. And peacekeeping is an ongoing going act. There's some other images. Just flick through them. I'm, I know I'm probably over time. You're right. But um, I've just amended that because we've got some lovely images I could tell you stories. But um, before I do go and lose the microphone, I would like to thank Susan and her team, um, Jody, for, and for putting this, this, this um, forum together and also the exhibition. They've asked wonderful questions. Their ability to dive into a, a very much unknown pool was wonderful. So I thank you for hosting this here today and I thank you for putting it on and choosing your subject. It's a brave subject. But we're together, our, what brings us together will bring us together. Our commonalities are what bring us together and service and de dedication to our country will do that. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for putting this exhibition and forum on. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Um, our next speaker is Uncle Harry Alley. Do you want to do it sitting there? You don't have to get up. Nah, he will. If you fall over, don't blame me. Um, <laughs> Uncle Harry, um, he's a, a Kajula elder from Charters Towers. Um, he's a Warren officer, retired, Royal Australian Air Force, and he was the inaugural um, Indigenous senior Indigenous member for Air Force. Um, He's well respected through the Air Force and well respected in the community. I know he's well respected in New South Wales in the Sydney area. So I'd like to introduce to you Uncle Harry Alley. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Gary, for just letting everybody know who I am. I didn't want you to think that I was some old bloke that walked in through the open doors and, and ended up on that top table looking for all the nice biscuits and all the nice cakes and all that sort of thing. But uh, to our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and certainly to the school students that are here, um, with such professional people sitting here around me, I wouldn't be game to quote anything in, through history and time. So. What I'm going to do is give you a bit of a story about Harry Alley, or I should say, as my mother uh, christened me, uh, and on my birth certificate was Harold James Alley, and my mother wouldn't have it anyway if anybody wanted to call me anything other than Harold. She would point the finger at it and say, it's Harold. But the Air Force, from the day one when I joined the Air Force, it was always Harry, so... In, in country, up in Charters Towers, where our good little mob is, it's uh, north of Rockhampton, it's uh, Harold, and south of there, it's Harry. So, uh, so that's why the two names sort of come into vogue. But uh, as we've just celebrated the theme this year, because of her, we can. And uh, I would like to give special mention to a lady that would be looking at me and be so proud of me, and that was my mother. My mother come through a very strong period when we were in our country and uh, she never had the opportunity to, to read and write. So between myself, she was so pleased when I could write and 
I've got big knuckles because we had to write with ink. There was no biros. I was the best sharp pencil sharpener in the business at school. So uh, I always took up the role of writing letters for mum and uh, and also reading the, the letters that she got. And I would always put a little PS on from my side of what to anybody she was writing to. But that's life. And, uh, and in my day, because we never had much money, I always wanted to go and work. And thank goodness we could go to work at 14 in those days. And uh, that's what I did. And... Uh, but I wanted to go out and ride buck jumpers and toss balls and all those sort of things and my mother. So I went and bought a, a seven pound swag and with a lot of money in those days and I'm talking in the 50s. And I come home with this, so proud of this green swag and my mother, I said, I'm ready to go out ringing now. And my mother said, I, you're not going ringing. She said, I don't. I said, I've got me swag. She said, I don't care what you do with your swag. So uh, I had to try and get a job in town. But uh, Charter's Towers being what it is, there was still a lot of discrimination. There was a little bit of added thing that Aboriginal people had no education and couldn't sort of work in the flash shops and uh, all that sort of thing. But uh, because I stayed away from school, uh, the head the high school principal come out and uh, I was sort of practising being sick. I was pretty good. I <coughs> cough and I'm saying I'm sick and... My mother used to say, if you're sick, well, you've got to go back to bed. But she'd, you could stay, you had to stay in bed till half past nine, then you could get up then. But this, when I got up, there was a flash on the windscreen, and it was the school principal, and shock horror. He was coming out to Manor Street, Charters Towers, where I lived, where we lived. And I went back and I stayed, jumped on the bed and <coughs> coughing while he was there. And my my mother said that I was going to leave to work and she said, he said, well, make sure he sits for the post office exam. So that's what I did. But not being very bright, I come seventh out of eighth. Anyway, uh, I was so pleased that in the following year, they asked me if I wanted to be a telegram boy and that was the first, my impressions of the military, looking smart with the PMG cap on, the big black belt and all that sort of thing. And I ended up being a post office thing. One day there was a big noise in the post office and the postmaster was talking to Mrs Smith and she wanted to know why Harold was employed before her son. And that postmaster to this very day, I still remember his name, was Joe Williams. And he said, Mrs Smith, Harold comes seventh and your son come eighth. And that, to me, was the first sign of equality. And the fact that he stood up for me and he didn't shuffle my name around. And that's what it was, and particularly where I sort of grew up in town and I'd be very disappointed when they were talking about riding buck jumpers and all that sort of thing. But for me to join the military, I had an uncle who served in World War I and World War II, and I thank Philippa for giving him recognition in her book. And I had uh, another uncle that served in World War II. My auntie served in the Women's Land Army. My father, because they wanted men on the land in North Queensland, served in the Triple C, the Civil Construction Corps. So I was always, when I went to my grandmother's next door, I always seen these lovely photos of them in uniform. The only time those photos come down, when the wedding photo come along and things like that. But that's what I wanted. I wanted at the time, I didn't want to join the army because I'd seen all what they did in the national service coming up to Charters Towers at Macrossan and Salim and all those sort of things. My aunties were the greatest ironers because of the World II in involvement and I'm starching uniforms and ironing them and all that. I never, I used to get cut fingers from the crisses that used to be in my, my trousers after my mother and any of the aunties doing them. So I joined the Air Force in the 5th of January 1966 and that was the difference for me. My brother wanted to join the Air Force but the Air Force didn't want him so he went down the hallway and joined the Army. So, uh, so that's how we had Air Force and Army in, in our household. But uh, to move on quickly, I thought I was going to get posted back up into Queensland so what did I do? I ended up in sail in Victoria 
And for me, a North Queensland trying to work out where sail is in Victoria, I had to go and pull out all the maps to work out where it was. And uh, But that was like a, another life in itself. The other thing was uh, to, to, I got very homesick at one stage. But the quality that they gave me from day one and the mates uh, that uh, I still sort of, I went to a reunion uh, a month ago where we still get together after 50 years and that equality. The only thing in those early days I was teasing them about, I must have had a hungry look because all the marriages would want to take me home for a good meal and not that there was anything wrong with the meals in the Air Force thing. But like uh, a lot of things, uh, there was also in that period, in that uh, early 60s, middle 60s period, there was discrimination and particularly with uh, mixed marriages and those sort of things. And I'll never forget on the ABC where they were interviewing a lady who was a non-Indigenous girl who married a, an Aboriginal man and they sort of couldn't get over how there'd be a mixed marriage situation. But to have closing comments on that program on the TV, she said, irrespective of what goes on during the day or whatever, once the lights go out, there's no discrimination. And, uh, <laughs> and I often thought of that, but... Uh, but that was to be as well, and my wife, who's non-Indigenous, she comes from Manjum up in Western Australia, and she come along, and uh, and I kept looking at her eyes, and I thought I was the bloke for her, and uh, what we'd have to do is, because she got promoted to sergeant, I couldn't sit into next to her in the movie, so I had to sit down with all the all the troops down the bottom, and she was up in the sergeant's uh, seats, and. So for me to, to sort of get up a bit closer, we used to go to the drive-in. But the only trouble is, as I was looking in her eyes to sort of move things along, there'd be a tap on the window and this bloke would be standing there and said, oh, here's your fog pass out. Come back tomorrow night. So <laughs> that's the sort of things that were always put in front of you. But that's what I always say. The services and the military has always given us equality. And particularly as I look at young ladies who might want to serve a career in the, in the Defence Forces, that's what it all is about, is to give you equality so that you too can be anything that you want to be and can stand alongside us all when we're on parade. The only trouble is uh, when I reach the dizzy heights of warrant officer, I used to always look from your top down to your toes and then go back to make sure that there was no crinkles or anything out of thing. But let me also say in the, my later life is uh, the mateship that has come out of all this and the context and the, and the good people. But we also work through. But I would like to go back to Auntie Dot Peters in the mid-2000, uh, where she approached the Minister for Veterans Affairs to sort of get recognition for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men who had served country. And from there, the momentum has gone through. I had the pleasure of being involved with the Coloured Diggers in the early days for the first march in Redfern. In my role as chair of the uh, Indigenous Ceremony at Hyde Park in the last Friday in uh, Reconciliation Week, our two major uh, ceremonies we have here in Sydney. I have the pleasure of sitting alongside with my mate there at the New South Wales Anniversary Lipley Council of where particularly to give recognition on what the centenary is about and the wonderful stories that have come out and particularly from people like yourself and it makes me wonder the ink that they had in those days or the pencil and to pull out all these old wonderful letters and the photographs has been unbelievable and and I think it's a wonderful legacy that we've created. But the other thing is, it's made us all aware, and particularly we're a very multicultural country, is that we've got a heritage. We've got something that we've come through. We want to prefer, preserve those values. And that's what we've got to do to, to involve the younger generation. But let me say to you, it has been from my position what I've gone through to be where I am, and particularly as my mother looks up from above, 
for see me standing in here where I am today, she couldn't. I would hope she would say, "You've done a great job, Harry Alley, or Harold Alley, I should say." <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Harold. Um, and and I've I've got to agree with with, with Harry. Um, I spent most of my all my younger years in the Defence Force and now my older years. And um, I found that the Australian Defence Force was probably, if not the first equal opportunity employer for Indigenous Australians for one reason or another. Um, and you got friends for life. Um, you know, I've got, I know guys that I served in submarines with 30 years ago and you never get rid of them. Um, and, and they're not Indigenous, you know. It, it's one of those things where you're all equal, you're all share, you're all the same. It, it's, it's a really good experience. Um, please put your hands together for our... Cool. Do you want to do that now or you want to come up? Do you want to do the questions? Do you want to do questions? Right, um, has anybody got any questions for any members of our panel? Well, that sorted that out. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be ashamed. Don't be frightened. We've got... Some... Uh, Gary Michael Flynn from the Royal United Service Institute at the Hyde Park Memorial. I just wonder about... I haven't seen any reference to the magnificent... Uh, I'll speak up. Yeah. Uh, magnificent uh, monument to the Indigenous on the western side of the memorial, the four live shells and the three empty cartridges. Uh, I just wonder how widely recognised it is by people who walk past that every day. Yeah, well, I actually was lucky enough to be on the committee that, that did that um, and they have an exceptional story. Um, I, I mean, a lot of people said, oh, they're whacking big bullets. How could that, you know, what did they represent? But that's the thing. It's one of those memorials, one of those monuments. You actually have to stop, look at it, and read the little plaque, this, what's there. Once you get read that and you understand what it means, it's a very personal story about one Indigenous person's life. Um, and it's about death and life, actually. The, the, the standing bullets are about survivors and the fallen cartridges are about those who didn't survive. And it's a personal story that's become a bit of a story for all Indigenous Australians and for Indigenous um, members in New South Wales. So yeah, when you walk past it, actually spend some time to understand what it's about. It's, it's quite phenomenal. Thanks for asking the question. Any more questions? Yeah, please. How's that feedback? That's all right. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. My name's Amy Lay from the National Archives of Australia. My question's mostly for Philippa and John. Um, in terms of the repatriation records, um, you spoke a lot about the service records and the added information they've made. John. I found, I just want to give you a particular insta instance how valuable they are. It's the case of um, John Hickey from Walgott, you know, the well known Hickey family, TJ's family. And um, we found his repat record, which clearly, clearly states he's Aboriginal and also states all the things he went through. He didn't marry and he had a lot of problems after the war. So that's just one instance um, where we found them really great. And I don't know whether John has found. John might. Yeah, no, look, the, the, there's, a, there's a lot... If I'm, I'm just trying to find the, the thing. Or someone else actually wrote about the repat records in this book, and I'm just trying to find that, that reference. I mean, um, that's one thing about the military records. I mean, I, certainly with the Protection Board and government policy, there's not a lot. There's an awful lot of fires with Aboriginal records that aren't there, but the military records are far better. And I mean, they're, they're more protected than what we've been able to find in regards to that. So yeah, now look, there's, there's stuff certainly there. 
and there's more to be done. I think the J26 to A30 series will be invaluable if you ever digitise those because there's an ongoing record of the events of the man after the war and it tells those, and it also tells you about his movements. It's got the addresses, the hospitals he's trying to apply to, what's going on, all of those, what seemingly is insignificant uses of the information but applied across a broader spectrum of numbers, it can tell you a lot about our men. And the effects of it, you know, such as did they get the support to get a, to get to um, a repat doctor and use the hospitals? Did they utilise the counselling services? Did they utilise the RSL? Did they utilise the other available resources that were available for non-Indigenous soldiers? The repat files will have a lot of that information in. So if you're ever thinking about another little project, Indigenous repat files would be one to digitise. Do you have any more questions? No? Okay, then. Well, we'll finish the questions. I'd like to get um, Suzanne, Shu and Jodie on stage, please, now. And we've got some little presentos for our panel. Thank you so much, Gary, and thank you to all our speakers. We just wanted to... Thank you. And we've got um, also just Thanks. for your help, Amy, just a little gift for you as well. Amy found all those documents and records for us. And that's the end of the forum. Please join us for a cup of tea. And I think John has to leave, but the others might be happy to talk to you more about their work. So come and have a cup of tea with us. Thank you.